Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to start our day today uh, with our uh, keynote speaker, Auden Vement. Uh, Auden is the David Rose, uh, David Ross Distinguished Professor of Nuclear Engineering and the Director of the Global Policy Research Institute at Purdue University. But uh, he, this is uh, only his, his current activity. Uh, I won't go through all the things that he's done in his career, uh, but some of the, the, the ones that are um, uh, important are he has a degree in, in metallurgical engineering from the University of Michigan, his PhD from that. Uh, he also has honorary doctorates from, I think, uh, eight institutions, seven or eight institutions, along with an, a wide range of other honors. Uh, one of the reasons we're very fortunate Auden is able to join us today is that he has a, uh, a career that spanned industry in General Electric and Battelle, uh, academia for MIT as well as Purdue, uh, and also served as the director of um, uh, uh, the National Institute of Standards uh, and uh, the National Science Foundation. And one of the uh, things that are, as he was the director of the National Science Foundation, that was during the time the Blue Waters Project was conceived and actually uh, implemented from 2004 to 2010. So we're very fortunate to have Auden share his uh, thoughts about not only uh, uh, learning from uh, the, the activities of the past, but also looking to the future. So I'd like to welcome Auden up here, uh, and if you can join me uh, and welcome him. Uh. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. It's uh, wonderful and a great honor to be here uh, in this setting to talk with you about a subject that we all uh, I love and uh, admire, computational science and engineering. My first uh, exposure to a supercomputer was a visit to NCSA back in 1987 uh, to visit Larry Smarr and uh, Jim Bottoms. I was quite impressed with the uh, scope of the program and also the progress they had made in only two years from start. And I had the opportunity to go back several times as a member of the National Science Board, as a member of the Ed Hayes uh, Blue Ribbon Panel of uh, Study Report, and as a director of the National Science Foundation. So I, I feel a special affinity for the place. I know it better than any other supercomputing center, although I've been to the others as well. What I want to do is uh, give a two-part presentation. The first part will be a quick reprise of the NSF's investment in high-performance computing. Uh, for the old hands here, this is uh, probably uh, old news, but for the students who are here and perhaps for one or two international participants, uh, this may have new, new meaning. It all started with Peter Lax. Uh, Peter is one of these Hungarian geniuses that came to the United States to uh, escape the uh, uh, Nazi overrun of Europe uh, just before 1941. Uh, Peter is a noted mathematician. He's a, he was a member in, before retirement uh, at the uh, Courant uh, Institute of Mathematics at New York University. He's the only mathematician I know that has won international top prizes in both applied and, and pure and fundamental math uh, mathematics. He won the Abel Prize for the application of partial differential equations to uh, problems in science and engineering. And he also won the Wolf Prize for his contribution to pure and uh, fundamental uh, mathematics. Uh, Peter decried the fact that uh, during the 1970s, scientists in the United States were not able to get cycles to run their computer programs on supercomputers because most of them bought by the, uh, the government existed in mission agencies and the mission agency work uh, took precedence. So in many instances, the uh, scientist had to go to Europe, either to England or Germany, to run his program, his or her program. So he, uh, he brought this to the attention of the National Science Board, which he joined in 1980 and felt that the NSF should play a role. Uh, the board agreed that he should uh, chair a panel, and uh, his report is called the Lax Report. You can see a picture of it here. 
The, uh, the report was very far-reaching, very comprehensive, but it also defined the role of the centers, which it recommended, uh, which has stood the course over the past three decades. Namely, that the center should increase access to high-performance computing for science and engineering. That goes without saying. It should increase research in computational mathematics, software, and algorithms. It should train personnel in high-performance uh, computing. And it should uh, perform R&D for the implementation of new supercomputing, con uh, uh, I have superconducting, supercomputing systems. Uh, this was the uh, Cray XMP, uh, similar to the one that uh, existed at NCSA at the time. There were three workhorses back in the uh, early, uh, in the mid 1980s. Uh, one was the Cray XMP, the other was the Cyber 205, and the third was the ETA 10, which was under development at the time. Th these computers operated at about um, 500 megaflops uh, speed and cost about $15 million, a sign of the time. The uh, response of the National Science Foundation to the LEX report was to initiate a three-phase program. The first phase, in order to get started quickly, was to purchase cycles from private computer, computers, some of which existed at universities. One, Purdue, was a participant in this part, phase of the program but there were others, and uh, that got things going until they could put out a solicitation for supercomputing centers, national centers. The uh, third phase of the program was to uh, develop the uh, experiments and the uh, experience of building these centers programs, but also developing regional networks. The winners, uh, the awardees of this uh, competition, which are well known to all of you by now, uh, Cornell Theory Center, the National Center for Superconducting Applications at Illinois, a Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, which was an alliance between Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, and Westinghouse Electric, uh, San Diego Supercomputing Center, and the John von Neumann uh, Center in Princeton, New Jersey, which was really an alliance of 11 universities, a consortium alliance, which operated the uh, center. After the first five years, the uh, uh, centers were recompeted and the uh, first four were renewed. Uh, the last one was not renewed because of difficulties in uh, governance, in finances, and also in uh, technical issues with the, key, with the computer. <laughs> now to go with these uh, and, and to build the regional networks, it was necessary also to have a communication network. And the network that NSF had at that time was the NSF net, which migrated over from DARPA, which was the DARPA net. And NSF uh, built uh, this uh, for general use. And it was used by the uh, centers to uh, support their, their, their communication networks. This operated from 1985 to 1995. And in 95, it was decommissioned primarily because the commercial internet came up and it was uh, superfluous. But uh, in that interim, NSF was working with DARPA, co-funding a program to develop, develop a very high performance backbone network service uh, based on optical fibers. And that happened to become available just at the time when they decommissioned the, the internet. And so all the nodes among the national centers uh, migrated to the VBNS network. Uh, that, operated till 2001, became very overloaded, had to be replaced. That was replaced by the TerraGrid. And then in 2011, the TerraGrid became overloaded and it was replaced by the Extreme Digital Grid. It's important to note that the first two communication networks are really regional networks centered on the computing centers, high performance computing centers. The last two are national networks and so it's a migration from regional to national over that period of time. At the end of the second five, year, um, five years of the program, 
we're now getting close to 1995, it was felt by the National Science Board that there should be an examination of the centers and um, an assessment of their performance, their contributions to science, in order to sustain the program. And so that became known as the Blue Ribbon Panel. Uh, their report from desktop to teraflop was uh, uh, given to the, the board in uh, 1993. The, the second study, which was very important, was commissioned by the U.S. Congress, which asked the uh, National Research Council to um, develop a committee on high-performance computing and communication and that report was completed in 1995. Well, now we're getting very close to the end of the uh, second uh, five-year period. And the board felt that it was necessary for the uh, National Science Foundation and the director to chart the course for the uh, program going forward. So they allowed a two-year extension of the program to allow a third task force, uh, which was the Hayes Report, which I had the honor of serving on, to uh, look at the future for the uh, NSF supercomputing centers. So the first two reports dealt with what could be done. The last report dealt with what should be done. And the first two reports, there were some common recommendations that uh, these weren't the total recommendations, but these are the ones that were pretty much in common. That the center should be judged on scientific impacts that the center should be broadly based, not just computation, not just data, but visualization, software support, um, and other, and, and training, and a variety of other functions. Should be, uh, there should be close relationship between the NSF program directors and the allocation committees to be sure that the, the uh, cycles were being allocated to the very best science. Uh, the center should build regional alliances to bring in other universities into computational science and engineering to build a structure, but not only a structure, but also a community of scientists and engineers who are computationally savvy. The staff should conduct center-aligned research, not compete with the users for individual grants, but to look at the future of the supercomputing centers and to build new capacity and capabilities. And the NSF should provide a pyramid of computing capabilities. First of all, Apex, a few Apex supercomputers, which were at the cutting edge of the uh, technology, and uh, mid-range uh, computers that would be uh, located at regional centers, uh, other major research universities, and then uh, advanced workstations at the base. There'd be many more of these at the base that would exist within departments and uh, research centers at the universities. So all this was input to the Hayes Committee, but there were some major issues at the time. Uh, keep in mind this is getting close to 1995. Massive uh, parallel uh, computers were coming into the market, and so one had to judge MPCs versus vector machines. And a lot of the codes the science codes at that time were, uh, were vector codes. Now some of those could be converted to massive parallel computing, but some of them couldn't. So the, uh, the Hayes Committee had to consider, should one of the apex centers have a vector machine, um, or should they all be massively uh, parallel computers? Also teraflop capability came on the scene, and DARPA had a program actually to uh, develop a market for these uh, large teraflop machines. It was a procurement program and it uh, did a lot to accelerate the development of, of teraflop scale uh, uh, computing. But then the, uh, the question is, should there be one center, one uh, NSF center that has a teraflop machine and then network with the other centers? Or how should that be done? The uh, committee also recommended that the uh, director of the National Science Foundation should play a leadership role in um, working with, with the mission-oriented agencies to be sure that cycles were made available to, uh, to scientists and engineers. The, but the other thing was that uh, 
The centers by this time were all performing pretty much the same functions. The question is, should there be partnerships among the centers in order to build synergy, to build uh, impact, and to uh, build leverage? And so the partnership idea came up, and I'll talk to, about that in just a moment. So the recommendations dealt with, first of all, there should be more than, than one apex partnership centers. In other words, continue what we're doing and have uh, uh, three or four, maybe five or six of these uh, national centers. Uh, the apex machine should be massively parallel computers. Uh, in other words, um, uh, vectors uh, were a thing of the past as far as the NSF program were, was concerned. Uh, and I, I touched on this uh, last point. <clears throat> so this led then to the PACI program which stood for Partnership for Advanced Computational Infrastructure. And there were two hubs. One was the National Computational Science Alliance led by NCSA. The other was the uh, National Partnership for Advanced Computational Infrastructure called NPACI, led by San Diego Supercomputing Center. They developed four teams which were cross-cutting among the uh, centers, one on technology development, another on building usable tools and infrastructure, the third distributing computing resources nationally, and the fourth was promoting within the community the use of computational technologies. But um, also there was a need with these uh, new, with the renewal of the program, which was going to build the capacity dramatically because all these new APEX centers now would have teraflop machines to also build a grid that uh, would be ca uh, capable of handling, uh, had, handling the uh, communications. So NSF announced in 2001 the Terra Grid. It involved 11 partner sites, coordinated in, by the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratory. And it provided access to all the functions that you know about in, uh, uh, among the supercomputers. But it was a national grid. Now this uh, brings me to the time when I, I went to Washington. I was initially at NIST. And the third year at NIST, I got a call from the White House. They said, oh, by the way, we're uh, about to, uh, well, Rita Caldwell, who was the director, resigned on short notice. And so they were looking for a new director, and they uh, put it this way, we're almost there, we've got a little bit of paperwork to do, would you uh, concurrently manage the NSF for about two or three months, or maybe it was weeks? And so I said, of course. And um, that stretched out to about 10 and a half months, almost uh, congressional. Well, by law, you can only do that concur concurrent uh, appointments for a congressional session which is about 10 and a half months. When I went to the National Science Foundation, I found that the uh, division who was charged with the uh, cyber infrastructure had already developed a roadmap in getting from teraflop to petaflop. It was a roadmap. But to get there would require resources that were well beyond what the uh, division was likely to obtain by competing with other division within the size uh, directorate. So that was a problem. The, uh, the other was that uh, in order to do this, it was important for the users to be involved. It wasn't just size directorate, it was all the other directorates because they also had to invest in uh, petaflop computation because that's where the computational science and engineering comes from, or the, uh, the user community. Um, and so I decided to establish the Office of Cyber Infrastructure in 2005 and go out and bring a director that would be on, on the policy group, the director's policy group. So there could be coordination across the, uh, the AD level, the director's level, and the office director's levels across the foundation rather than at a lower level. And also we could compete independently for the Office of Cyber Infrastructure as far as building a budget for petascale computing. Now the first person I went to was a go-to person at NSF who had taken on very difficult assignments, 
who also had background in the field, and that was Dr. Deborah Crawford, um, who during the uh, period of 2005 to 2007 coordinated the planning document, Cyber Infrastructure Vision for the 21st Century, which was the roadmap and the framework for going forward with uh, Petascale. She was siphoned away from Drexel University to become a vice provost. Good for her. Uh, so I went uh, and, and asked Dan Atkins, who was um, an associate dean of engineering at the University of Michigan, if he would uh, come and, and work with us. And he took a, a leave of absence from 2007 to 2008. And he led the, uh, um, the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. But prior to that, he had also led a Blue Ribbon Advisory Panel within the foundation uh, and developed the report Revolutionizing Science and Engineering Through Cyber Infrastructure. In other words, it was making the case for why cyber infrastructure was important. So he was an ideal person to put in this position. Well, at the end of his year, he obviously went back to the University of Michigan, and we were very fortunate to find uh, Dr. Ed Seidel, who was uh, director of the uh, Center for Computational Technology at uh, Louisiana State University, but also chief scientist for the uh, Louisiana Optical ne Network Initiative, but also uh, uh, a great uh, scientist in his own realm uh, as an astrophysicist uh, with a PhD from Yale University with very strong credentials. So he was not only strong in, in, in the cyber infrastructure world, but he was also very strong in the user world as well. Um, and he, uh, he came and took the position from 2008 and 2009. So these three leaders essentially uh, built the impetus, built the momentum, and also built the program and allowed me to get the funding from the Congress to um, get us where we needed to go. But again, when you build the uh, capacity, you also have to pay attention to uh, uh, the pyramid. So again, we used the, uh, the pyramid and the Apex computers at the time I left were either uh, purchased or about to be purchased um, of course, the, at NCSA, there's the Cray Blue Waters uh, computer, which I understand now is operating at about 13.2 petaflops. Uh, that ran into difficulty, as you well know. I worked with Bob Easter in trying to get that straightened out and assured him that the NSF would stand behind him, whatever he decided to do. So we shifted the uh, contract to... Uh, to, uh, from IBM to Cray. There was a Cray Kraken computer at the uh, National uh, Institute for Computing uh, uh, Science at, uh, run by University of Tennessee at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I believe it's operating at about 1.2 petaflops presently, maybe more. Uh, these numbers have a way of growing with time. And then the Intel Dell uh, Mellanox a Stampede computer at the Texas uh, Advanced Computing Center, which is operating at close to uh, 10 petaflops. And with that, of course, oh, incidentally, every time I go through one of these centers, I figure that, I, I feel that if these were painted white, it would look like a refrigerator factory. Um, but this is a somewhat typical, beautiful setup. Now this is the Blue Waters uh, supercomputer. But now, again, you have to worry about communication capacity because now the data flow is now getting uh, into the high petabytes and almost the exabyte per day range. And so NSF established a technology and search and service team called TIS with uh, the four of the major centers, NCSA, TACC, uh, Pittsburgh, and the Oak Ridge Center, and uh, designed a new service called Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment called Exceed, and funded three new clusters, uh, including uh, the uh, Exceed cluster Gordon at uh, SDSC, uh, cluster uh, Backlight at uh, Pittsburgh, 
16 uh, terabytes of shared memory. All these are teraflop, uh, tera terabyte uh, scale. And then um, a luster base, two, two luster base uh, clusters at uh, uh, Cornell uh, Center for Advanced uh, Computing. So, uh, so much for the history of, um, of where we've been at the um, um, mega scale to getting to the petascale. Now, looking ahead, where are we going to be 10, 15 years from now? Are we going to be at exascale or will it be something entirely different? So the second part of my talk is going to be looking to the future. I'm going to first talk about synaptic computing because that's new and different. Um, high performance computing and data analysis uh, for the future and cloud computing and the uh, Internet of Things. I was going to talk about quantum computing, but um, that's under wraps and there isn't very much I could tell you that would be unclassified, so I decided not to, uh, to do that. So let's uh, start with uh, synaptic uh, computing. Last April, IBM made a startling announcement, namely that they had uh, developed a synaptic chip. And um, what was startling about it was that they had developed this, fully developed, in six years after the start of funding under the DARPA Synapse program, under a consortium with several universities and, and one or two other private firms. Now this is the chip. It's a four by four uh, a cluster. It's about the size of a postage stamp. It uh, consumes only 70 milliwatts of energy, um, about equivalent to a hearing aid battery. And um, it uh, carries out 76 billion synaptic operations per second per watt. Really remarkable. Um, this is a brain inspired chip based on a neural network architecture with 1 million individually programmable neurons and 256 million individually programmable synapses. It was designed based on a human scale brain simulation. Now the human brain ranges from a, a hundred trillion synapses up to about 500 trillion synapses. Um, the model was at 100 trillion and it operated on the um, um, Sequoia computer at uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. But in addition to that, they had to develop a new programming paradigm. It couldn't be based on <coughs> a von Neumann uh, architecture, uh, namely ones and zeros. So they developed uh, what they call a correlate approach, which a correlate you can think of as a small Lego block and there are a variety of these, and you can assemble them and assemble lines of code that will uh, emulate the spiking model to um, um, perform the 20 uh, functions of a biological brain. So th this is, again, the backbone of the program and used to design the, uh, the chip. Now, if you look at the human brain, and here you'll see the, uh, the left brain, which happens to be on the right, and the right brain that happens to be on the left. I tried to flip this around, but then you'd have to read the words from right to left, so I didn't think that was very practical. But if you look at the left brain, the left brain uh, carries out the functions such as uh, uh, mostly a numerical, mathematics, uh, reasoning, logic, analytical thought. Uh, these are functions that uh, the von Neumann architecture can handle and handle well. But if you go to the right brain, you'll find functions such as creativity, imagination, prediction, self-awareness, uh, hol holistic thought, music, music appreciation, art appreciation. These are pretty much abstract functions and can best be done with a synaptic neural net architecture. So now you have a, a von Neumann architecture and a synaptic architecture. The leader of the IBM synaptic team, uh, synapse team, uh, de, 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 excuse me, uh, Darmendra 
Moda, Dharmendra Moda, who's an IBM fellow, um, ex expressed the concept of what would happen if you tied these two architectures together. What kind of a hybrid computer would you have? And how would you connect them? And what would its functions be? And one thing that came to mind uh, to me is, if you had such a computer, it would, perform, it would provide a natural bridge to the human. You could have uh, a, a connected bridge between what the human can do best and what the computer can do best, what the machine can do best. And I thought a bit further and thought, well, what would this be useful for? Well, perhaps it might be useful in creativity to look beyond the frontiers of science into the nebular region where you can look at patterns evolving, you can look at convergences and nodes developing. And uh, perhaps you can even look along the frontier to identify where there may be a salient where the next big concept, scientific concept might, might emerge. So that's one potential application. But there are several, so I already said that. So the, uh, this list are a few other ideas. Wouldn't it be great to accelerate learning, risk analysis, and decision making? Uh, to uh, develop anticipatory controllers that could identify upset conditions well in advance based on the trend in the uh, use of the system and, and the age of the system itself. Um, that exists to some, time, uh, to some extent today in using neural fuzzy logic and uh, SCADA controllers. Uh, but this would be far more robust. And then it could take corrective action within a millisecond. Uh, it could be a bias filter for social research. You could identify the sources of internal and external bias and what the consequences of that bias might be in a design of experiment or a random control test. Uh, you could uh, develop self-aware robots that might have some human functions like self-awareness, pattern recognition. Um, and then, of course, we, this could get out of control. You might have a Hal Light robot with an attitude. Uh, you could have adaptive sensor, sensor networks that um, it would uh, be multifunctional and would uh, um, be adaptive to the uh, operating environment. You could have self-operating systems. Now, some of these are emerging now, as you, as you well know, in manufacturing especially, transportation, public safety. The military is very much looking at robots and automation. And then the idea came to me, well, how about a smartphone a medical diagnos diagnostic tool that uh, knowing what your symptoms are and what your history is as you know them could give you a number of alternative uh, diagnostics that would indicate what the, uh, the problem might be. It occurred to me there are a lot of doctors that could use this too uh, in order to look at the, uh, the options. I'm sure you could expand this list several pages. So now let's go to high performance computing and data analysis. I want to touch on this in two ways. To talk about solving grand challenge problems, world problems, global problems. And the second to talk about education and workforce development. Now, grand challenge problems usually don't stand alone they're often coupled with other grand challenge problems. So you have the problem of coupled analysis with coupled variables. And of course, depending on how you set the boundary conditions, you can really end up with different, uh, different uh, directions in solving the problem. These are called nasty problems because many of, them have, uh, many of these problems have more than one solution because of the coupled variables. And this is where politics often come in or decision making to decide which of these alternate uh, solutions is, is the, uh, the most uh, politically uh, or economically uh, suitable. Uh, let me give you an example. One grand challenge problem is uh, energy sustainability. But it's not possible to get to energy sustainability unless you sustain the environment and unless you have economic sustainability. 
<clears throat> so the question is, how do you model this holistically? And what kind of a model can you develop? The problem is bounded by meeting demands for electric power without add adding uh, to the CO2 burden or increasing the cost of energy. Well, can this problem be solved? Well, it has been um, run, at any rate, by a team from NOAA and the University of Colorado. And um, let me uh, get to my note here for a moment. The uh, NOAA team is led by uh, Sandy McDonald, Alexander McDonald, who's the chief scientist of NOAA, but also director of the Earth Systems Research Laboratory at the uh, NOAA Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. And a team from the um, University of Colorado, uh, uh, led by Christopher Clack in the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. And they set these requirements for the model. Um, first, it has to, be, uh, it has to meet uh, contigu contiguous uh, U.S. energy demands at all times. Electrical generation uh, it will be by renewables and natural gas. They didn't take credit for uh, atomic energy. Um, electric transmission would be national, a national grid operated uh, with high voltage uh, DC uh, uh, conductors. Um, it would have a high temporal, high spatial resolution weather model, weather data. Uh, the spatial resolution would be about 14 kilometers on a side, and the uh, temporal resolution would be about 60 minutes, which will indicate the uh, uh, the fineness of this uh, this uh, weather model. The model year would be 2030, uh, in which they estimated a 15 percent increase in energy demand between now and then. New wind generation would be pr principally along Tornado Alley from Texas to the uh, Montana North Dakota border where wind is persistent. And the uh, new <laughs> photovoltaic uh, solar energy uh, generation would come from the uh, southwest where uh, solar insulation is, is prevalent. And then they also brought in an economic model to vary the various cases for natural gas and renewable electric power costs. This model incidentally was run on again the uh, Sequoia computer of Lawrence Livermore and there's a paper pending uh, so I can't give you necessarily a reference but the reference for the economic uh, model is in the paper I submitted on, on my talk. But the uh, results are, are stunning. They, they found that by wheeling power on a national grid with a robust combination of renewable and natural gas, and natural ga gas generation can be load following, uh, which is very important. You can uh, reduce CO2 emissions for, from, uh, for electric power generation by 80% compared with 1990 levels, which is lower than today's levels. Now that is really dramatic. The cost of electric uh, generation are, are not substantially increased. And the results can be obtained without a large amount of electric storage. Maybe in some regional grids there would be some storage, but because of load following of natural gas plants, uh, there wouldn't have to be massive electric storage. Uh, hopefully this uh, paper will, will be published soon so you can read it. I think you'll be impressed with the, the amount of work that went into this and the amount of um, uh, careful work done before they released it. Now, in education workforce development, I want to touch on Hub Zero tools. Um, these tools are very similar to the kind of tools that are used at the computing centers, except for a difference. These tools are based on a community of interest. So the, uh, the databases, the algorithms, the software, the various tools for simulation and visualization and so forth are community centric, they're thematic. It's not like a national center where everything pours in for all communities. And in terms of big data, this is a pretty big down select to begin with is to start with a community of interest. Furthermore, 
if, if, if it is an open source, and if the products that are put into this hub have an author, it becomes uh, self, uh, self-managed and uh, the quality control is, is maintained. So uh, the, um, the tool itself is only partly outlined here. There's much more to it than what I've indicated in this slide. It's called a Swiss Army knife. Um, and if you don't find a blade you want, you just generate a new blade and add it to the knife. But it has analytical modeling and simulation tools online lectures, courseware, seminars, and practice quizzes, information sharing and joint publication tools, a community coupled uh, compiled databases, topical articles, etc. So it can invert the, uh, the learning process. And I know that you're going to be dealing with this subject in this seminar, in this workshop. At Purdue University, we have close to 100 courses now that are inverted. In other words, the students hear the lecture and they, uh, they do the background work in their pajamas. They come to class and uh, organize as teams and they work problem sets uh, with the instructor and the, uh, the graduate assistant. And it forces the faculty to have two skills, not just lecturing skills and teaching skills, they also have to learn mentoring skills as well. So it integrates all the modalities of learning and I thought this might be of interest to you. Now, these are just some of the communities. Now, I said 27 hubs. I was uh, reminded this morning it's more like 40 uh, by Dr. Eigenman. But the, uh, the granddaddy of these hubs is the nanotechnology hub, which now has 300,000 users, and that has undoubtedly expanded since I started writing this talk. And then you can see all the other communities represented. Now the one I wanted to touch on a little bit more is the last one, high throughput to the computing, or the diagrid. Uh, this is really a, a regional network. It's a partnership among 10 Midwest universities, including uh, Purdue, Indiana, Wisconsin, Nebraska, uh, Notre Dame, and a few others. It contains 50,000 processors, it processes approximately 15 million jobs, delivering 18 million hours of computing time annually. And it's, uh, at last count, the largest regional computing alliance in the U.S. Now, I'm not talking about a national center, I'm talking about a regional alliance. Uh, finally, in cloud computing and Internet of Things, these are complementary tools for the control and performance modeling of uh, such complex systems, and you can see the list. Uh, these are already being done. There are many manufacturing operations that are using the combination of cloud computing and Internet of Things. Same thing in uh, managing global supply chains, uh, logistic networks, transportation and shipping networks. Uh, it's coming on to the electric distribution grid as part of the smart grid initiative and fourth generation SCADA and major scientific instruments and it's this last one I want to touch on. <coughs> uh, many of these major instruments are in places that are not very accessible like in the uh, Atacama uh, Desert, high in the Andes in, in Chile, uh, which is the highest desert in the world and the South Pole. Now the best viewing time for a telescope at the South Pole, is at the South Pole, is in the uh, austral winter period, um, where the South Pole is the driest part of the, of the world. It's drier there than any place else because of the uh, climate. Um, also the sky is blacker than any other place in the world. But unfortunately, it's not the best time for scientists to be working at the South Pole because temperatures can get down to minus 60 centigrade and you can have uh, violent storms at times. So this is a fully programmable telescope so that the telescope is pre-programmed to uh, survey the sky. The data is collected. It goes to a computer, supercomputer, for processing. And the uh, 
cosmologists or the astrophysicists can review the results in his laptop computer in, either in his office or on the beach. Um, this is becoming more and more uh, prevalent in uh, big science, as we would call it. So on a final note, I would encourage those of you who teach computational science and engineering courses uh, based on emerging technologies to uh, introduce your students to finding solutions to these complex grand challenge global problems. Get to a higher systemic level to try and understand not only the uh, interconnections but also the, uh, um, the contextual factors because most of these grand, problem, uh, grand challenge problems have a context that has to be considered. Uh, developing online, real-time, safe, secure, and reliable controls for very complex systems like nuclear reactors or like supercomputing centers, which can also have loss of coolant accidents. Uh, discovering new modalities for the acquisition, assimilation, and application of new knowledge. Uh, the pathway ahead over the next decade or two is going to be more challenging, more interesting, more exciting, and different than it is today. We don't know what NSF's role is going to be uh, during the next two decades. We don't know what, these, uh, suit, what, uh, what computational science and engineering will be like. And we don't know what kind of centers or what kind of networks we need to build. Um, but your students will be part of that. So um, that's my final word. Thank you very much. You've seen uh, the change in the classroom. A lot of lecture rooms are like this, except they're tiered. They're filled with maybe a thousand students with one lecture at the, uh, the bottom of the uh, tier. Um, and so he gives a lecture. And that's his role. The role of the student is to pretend to be awake during the lecture. Um, that's one way to impart knowledge, it's one way to learn, but it's not the only way. Um, people who work in this field give much more credence to peer learning and also to activity-based learning. Uh, so this is where team learning comes in. So the idea is, if the student is not attentive and not spending all his time taking notes, he loses the value of the lecture. But if you put it on, on the uh, net, on the internet, he can look at those parts of the lecture that are of most interest or where he feels he, he needs to pay attention, he or she needs to pay attention. They can either fast forward or fast back and do it over and over again. So they have a lot of, a lot of flexibility. They can pick their own time for learning. They don't all have to be in a big lecture room. Um, the, so that's part of the, the inversion. The classroom is then used for team learning, for mentoring, and for doing problem work. That's where they do their homework. They don't do their homework back in the dorm. They do the homework in the classroom. That's what I mean by inversion. Uh, another, any, I think I saw another hand over, over here. If um, you can uh, state your name and your institution and uh, wait till the microphone, then it'll be part of the, the recorded session. Yeah, hi, uh, Zan Luthi Shulton from the University of Illinois. Could you just expand a bit about how you teach uh, for the code, particularly when I see that, like this for this electric distribution security, like that's uh, not a typical course other than encryption that we see at the university. So, uh, you know, it, it's, we're normally focusing on trying to take a complex situation and model it computationally, yeah. but how, how do you address this issue of security? Well, security is a lot like quality. The time to do security is at the beginning. You design it in. We have an internet that was not designed to be secure. We have an internet that was designed to be accessible. The problem is it's too accessible and not, not secure enough. Um, so we do have a serious center, which is a cybersecurity center. Um, there are about 70 faculty from all over the campus that are part of this center. They do have courses 
where they introduce security issues uh, in their courses, where it may deal with computation, it may deal with data, it may deal with, with other topics. Um, but um, the Computing Center at uh, Purdue is uh, somewhat different than at uh, Illinois. Uh, we don't go for heavy metal on the floor. We, we have a distributed system, a matrix system. Um, where we uh, scarf up all the unused cycles on campus, which increase every year, <laughs> almost as fast as the, uh, the technology increases. So that's put us uh, in the high terra, uh, terra, uh, terra, uh, teraflop range uh, just there. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we buy storage as we need it, not just the storage that comes with the, uh, with the servers and the computers and so forth. But uh, we, can, uh, we can buy it by the trailer. And if we need more storage, we buy another trailer. Now this diagram that I was talking about, now you've got 10 major Midwest universities that can all, all share all their storage uh, on the diagram. And so now you can see you're already in the terrascale uh, 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 terra range uh, almost automatically. Now the interesting thing is that each year at uh, the winter term, <coughs> uh, the students build a new supercomputer at the university by coupling the servers and, and um, uh, the network within the university. Um, and so now we've got about uh, six, five or six supercomputers. Um, that system was uh, designed by Jim Bottoms when he came from the University of Illinois to Purdue, so that was one benefit we got from Jim in uh, setting up that, uh, that system. It works like a charm. Furthermore, you don't have to worry about cooling computers. You don't have to worry about loss of coolant. You don't have to use, worry about massive amounts of uh, power uh, because that's all distributed among a, a, a few thousand uh, laptops or workstations for that matter. So it makes a big difference. And latency is not as much of a problem as you might think. Uh, in fact, the Carter computer was ranked as one of the fastest uh, computers that was built along this, uh, this model. And did I answer your question or did I just digress? You digressed, but it was an interesting digression. <laughs> uh, it was, it, as they say, you're seeing all these many solutions to supercomputing, and I agree, you need to think about security from the get-go. Oh, we security, haven't. yes. So now, how do we impose it yeah. sort of later well, on? And the more things you hook onto it, it can be just some clueless person comes in and logs in with this laptop that brings down one of the, the let, servers and hacks it, 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 the system. Let, let me put it in military engineering terms. You can put out a minefield. But if you don't observe the minefield and, and defend the minefield, it's not going to do any good because it will be, it will be penetrated. When you build a firewall, you have, to, you have to guard the firewall. You have to monitor it continuously. You just can't build a firewall and assume that you're secure. It doesn't work. Also, you have to test your system periodically. Um, uh, and you have to test it with experts people who know what they're doing, who intentionally try to hack your system or to try and um, uh, pull off a denial of service attack, uh, which is getting to be more of a problem. Um, you know, with, with commercial software, anyone can uh, hack a computer or can develop a, a hundred or maybe a thousand bots to do a denial of service attack. Now, when it's that prevalent, you have to, you have to defend against it. Uh, there's much more to it than that, but you, you know the, uh, the rubric. You have to pay attention to details if you want to secure your... You have to pay attention to your passwords. The Sony password was a very simple password to, uh, uh, to overcome. It was probably uh, defeated in about, about three seconds. <laughs> So the, the, those are, so when you take these courses, you learn a lot about how to deal with this, but it's all patchwork. It's not designed in from the very beginning, so you're always patching. So it's like the, uh, the penetrator and the armor. 
when you build a better penetrator, the opponent builds a better armor. And when they build a better armor, you have to build a better penetrator. So it's an ongoing problem. Uh, we have time for one more question. In the sense of uh, you know a lot of the good historical uh, perspective, and one thing that I like to um, to ask is about synaptic computing, and um, you know you mentioned the IBM chip and so on, and um, do you think that um, uh, the synaptic computing is going to be going into these big scale computers, or they're going to really uh, be more in the uh, in, in the uh, area of, uh, I would say, used in these laptops and so on in the future with special chips. For example, IBM, uh, when Arvind Krishna give, goes around and gives his talks, he actually doesn't uh, say that there is currently no plan for IBM to build anything more than a rack or so of these chips because it's used, really used as a super classifier. So yeah. what, what do you think synaptic computing is going to impact the big machines in the future? Um. If I were in the industry, or if I were in the field, I could probably answer that question. I'm not sure that my opinion would carry much weight in this group. <laughs> but uh, it's a very good question. It's uh, one that I think this, at this workshop, you ought to pay a little attention to and bring it up and see what the collective uh, ideas are within this group. Because I, I firmly believe in the next five years, it's going to change. And NSF, if they're going to be a player, uh, will have to have advice from the community to determine in which way it's going to have to change. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Auden for, for a great session.